Hello, welcome to Film Trace. This is a podcast where we trace the life of a film from conception to production all the way to release and reception. We always pick a new release film, whether it's in theaters or new released on streaming. Our film today is The Weatherman from 2005 that is newly released on Hulu. Chris, what is The Weatherman all about? Wow. Well, yes, uh, it's an interesting choice for us because there's probably a lot of other movies we could have gone with that were released on streaming uh, on July 1st. But uh, we went with probably one of the more forgotten choices. And it's still not old. Fifteen years ago, uh, the director of both The Ring and the first Pirates of the Caribbean, Gore Verbinski, wanted to make a family drama, I guess, or a existential crisis drama. I'm not sure what exactly he was going for. We're going to explore that today. Essentially, it stars Nick Cage. You may remember, if anything, about this movie. You perhaps recall the movie poster, which is Nicolas Cage in a bad wig uh, and a suit walking down the streets of Chicago with a bow and arrow. Uh, If anything, that's a pretty striking image for a pretty boring idea for a movie. David Spritz, played by Nicolas Cage, is a weatherman who, despite success at his job at a local news station in Chicago, is deeply unhappy. He's eclipsed by his father, Robert, who play, is played by Michael Caine, a celebrated Pulitzer winner, and his uh, ex-wife, Noreen, played by Hope Davis, uh, that he, you know, stereotypically wants back, uh, along with his two kids. Um, he resolves to get his life in order by p- applying for a high-profile job on a New York City Bryant Gumbel-hosted talk show. Uh, but yeah, that's that's it. That it's it's him trying to get this job and also trying to be happy and get his life back together. Um, but it's it's quite a downer. Um, oh yeah, shot it's shot the- exclusively on overcast Chicago <laughs> days. <laughs> well, but I think it's interesting too to talk about like why why did we decide to choose this movie? Yes, because there's so many different movies out there, and I think for us as you know, two people were in our, our early 20s when this came out. Um, it certainly piqued our interest to some degree as sort of, oh, it's Gore Verbinski, we know him. It's got Nicolas Cage. It looks sort of arty, I think, was why we were attracted mm-hmm. to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it comes out, and I would consider it to be a complete mess upon our first release when I first saw it. Uh, and we'll talk about a little bit more what that, how it's changed over time. But it was one of those films that could have launched uh, Gore Verbinski and Nicolas Cage in a different direction, I think. Um, and it just didn't really work at the time, box office wise or critically. And so it's kind of a lost film. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons we wanted to choose it. I mean, did you you saw it when it first came out? Oh, yeah. And I was uh, quite interested in it. I perhaps didn't put the Gore Verbinski piece together, but I definitely thought of Nick Cage as kind of like this gateway. Uh, he had just been in adaptation um and at the same time was a big action star so like i followed him throughout my adolescence both from like the nascent days of big explosions like con air and the rock all the way through you know understanding things like meta textual analysis in college with adaptation but then the weatherman comes out and it's it's so bizarre because it is a big budget attempt at something small which uh as you aptly put in one of your tweets is kind of like how American Beauty became a su- surprise success. But as we perhaps know, and I believe we talked about this on the Wild Line podcast, our former box office podcast at one point, we looked back at the success of American Beauty and it was a complete fluke, right? So yeah. the idea that they were going to be able to capture that kind of success again uh, seems misbegotten to say the least. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, when looking at where this lands in Gore Verbinski's career, specifically in Nick Cage, it is kind of a weird sandwiched movie. Like Gore had done The Ring in 2002, Pirates of the Caribbean um, in 2003. Then he does The Weatherman two years later. And then he goes back to Pirates of the Caribbean. Like it is (laughs) such an off the beaten path film in so many different ways. And Nick Cage was doing everything. He the writer is not very well known. Uh, Steve Conrad, he did Pursuit of Happiness later for the same production company. Um, Secret Life of Walter Mitty later on, Unfinished Business. Some really terrible movies. Uh, Mm -hmm. And this is sort of his first big chance uh, to sort of make his name in a major studio film. And then Nick Cage this year also did, in 2005, Lord of War, if you remember that. But the year before, he did National Treasure. The year after, he does World Trade Center. The Wicker Man, he is all over the place. Yeah, and this then, is the beginning of the end for Cage, oh, I believe. absolutely. And he never sort of recovered that sort of, I, I think he had integrity before. Maybe that's just me 
putting um, some spin on it, but he he basically started to have a schizophrenic career where some really arty good films like a Mandy, which I love, uh, and then crazy stuff like Wicker Man, which is just basically unwatchable. Uh, but it's interesting to sort of figure out where this uh, uh, film came to be, uh, especially from the writer here in this script, because the script was really the start of this whole thing. There was a bidding war, uh, and the, one of the key features of the film, which is Nick uh, Nick uh, Nick Cage's character getting hit by fast food usually usually a drink of some sort uh that actually was sort of the start of this script so stephen conrad uh one of his local weatherman called al sunshine down in florida uh actually got hit with a milkshake and, and sort of from that idea uh steve started to write this script all about how these local celebrities uh, inspire backlash because they seem to have fake personas on TV. Uh, so it starts out with a uh, the initial spark, creative spark of this film is pretty small, I would say, right? Like it's it, a kernel. It's a kernel. <laughs> like it's not really that. There's not a lot of meat on the bones there. No. Um, and there is, you know, there's a great article that we found um, in the LA Times. Uh, all about sort of this script and how it came to be. And there's a lot of background here, but just, we just want to touch on some things that sort of stuck out uh, in terms of how this script was made and how this story was created. You know, stuff like the relationship between uh, David and his father. His father obviously Oof. is this sort of um, genius uh, author. Uh, and David's a weatherman in Chicago and he feels, you know, very lesser than. And a lot of that comes from uh, Steve's life and also Gore's life. Uh, Gore Verbinski's father was a, I think, a research scientist, like a physicist right. or something. Nuclear physicist. Nuclear physicist. So there's this dichotomy with both the director and the writer of this sort of smallness, male smallness, and be emasculated by your own father. Uh, there's some interesting quotes from this interview uh, from Ber- Verbinski and from uh, Conrad. One from Bergins- uh, Verbinski is, uh, David Spritz's dad is Atticus Finch. There's greatness there. <laughs> I think there isn't that greatness in David uh, in Dave Spritz, but he thinks there is. He suffers from believing there is more to him than there actually is. Uh, another one uh, from Gore. Uh, his father is uh, filet mignon, and he's an egg McMuffin. Uh, I feel like the fil- film deals with the entire struggle against mediocrity. Um, and there's Which some other a, crazy quotes. Highly, there. I mean, there's crazy- uh, yeah, there's there's it's it's a it's a treasure trove. We'll tweet out the link. Yeah, to the it's so good. L.A. Times piece. But it, I mean that that quote you just read is kind of part and parcel of the misbegottenness of this film because. The great irony to it is that the film is highly mediocre. I don't even know if I would go so far as to say it's like straight up bad because there are, I think, redeeming elements to it. And we'll get more into this when we get into the reception of the film. But the idea that um, Gore Verbinski, Verbinski, uh, the guy who um, conceptualized the Budweiser frogs in the 90s, (laughs) teamed up with this guy, Steve Conrad, who fold his first script at age 19 um uh wrestling Hemingway which is like a pretentious like uh older audience skewed romantic film um the idea like the two that those two teaming up is like hilarious and it's it's just a recipe for disaster but there's enough like smartness in terms of just like the overall craft of it like you say what you will about the pirates movies um like verbinski knows what he's doing he's he's putting together products that that's that soar when he's just going for product but then combining that with the artistic existential sensibilities of steve conrad it just makes for this weird mishmash oh absolutely put, yeah it's all and over the put place. that on top yeah and put that on the top of the fact that um michael kane's father character is also like kind of depicted as like a real like aloof dolt it just it just feels like dripping with this personal vengeance against their own fathers which is really just comes off as gross and speaking as both a father and a son myself but there there was there's a lot of interest in this movie so you know the the script was written based on this concept father son um you know the weatherman it's like a there's two different ideas thrown together it's the weatherman idea mm-hmm. and the father son relationship and it doesn't really work out uh, at all i mean the chicago weatherman stuff there's even a quote on the dvd special um with nick cage the chicago weatherman is a very important weatherman 
because everyone in Chicago relies on him so much. And if he gets it wrong, he really ruins their day. They're like really <laughs> digging into this, the specifically mm-hmm. Chicago weatherman concept. Uh, and then like Gore too, you know, he chose this because it was difficult. He said, certainly the ring and pirates movies, uh, nobody believed in, uh, there's almost a suicidal, <laughs> yeah, there's almost a suicidal nature in picking projects that shouldn't work and taking the safe way. There's no more painful death than the safe one is what he said about this. Film. I mean, like, so there's just a lot of ego going on across the board. Yeah. And you just it, one of the things that I picked out almost immediately versus a movie like a sideways or something like that, which I think is kind of a contemporary and a good comparison is that. Yeah, they they, they identified it, I believe, uh, one of the critics as you know, this year's attempt at a sideways. Exactly. And that's what it is. It's an attempt at a sideways. When they made sideways, they didn't attempt to make another movie. Right. Exactly. They like they're trying to make something really interesting and deep um, and reflective of their own lives. And here it's just like a pretty sad attempt to copy something else is what it feels like. Um, so there was a, a script bidding war. Uh, and then finally, you know, Sony was attached. United Artists was attached. Focus Features was attached. Uh, but then Escape Artists got it for low six figures, actually high six figures. Uh, and then uh, Sony dropped it. But then Escape Artists picked it back up and they finally got it released on their own. So it was kind of a, a messy uh, it was a messy movie all the way from the script forward. Um, and what about the production? How much does this thing cost to make? Yeah, $22 million, which I was looking for while I was watch, re-watching this film on Hulu. Um, and it's really hard to find where they where the 222 was spent. I mean, obviously Nick Cage uh, and Michael Caine. Um, but other than that, like they, there's not a lot going on here that seems worth it uh the director of photography fidan papa michael um recall that they discovered location just by walking around the city with the digital so there's not like there's like a lot of effort put into scouting locations like it's a lot of it takes place on the streets of chicago in uh nick cage's ex-wife's home a doctor's office obviously the news station but it i mean i don't know where, where do you think they spent all this money like i, I know that's yeah. not a huge budget for a major motion picture but for like a small drama i mean i could has one lead actor i could see it in like some of the polish to it there wasn't you know it didn't seem like an indie film at all with the shots and stuff like that there's a lot of strange shots that um you could tell they had extra money lying around is what it felt like uh Mm -hmm. and so it's one of those films where i think that um they're just trying to do they're always trying to do way too much with it you know if something in the story didn't work they probably wanted to you know shoot five different angles or doing more arty shot to make it seem like there was something going on Uh, and the sort of the color palette choice obviously kind of you know like something that you would do to make some like a piece of great art you would make a decision like that but here it comes across as just totally pretentious right like the the same muted color palette for chicago constantly um and it's interesting because that does reflect the character of David, um, but it doesn't do anything else. Like it just you no. sit there and you watch it and you're like, this is really flat. His character is really flat. And then yeah. there's no ironic undercurrent to that. And you're just sort of like, this is ridiculous. Um, in terms of mm-hmm. filming in Chicago, Gore said the weather is a character. Chicago is a character. So we made a lot of budget cuts in a lot of places, but it was worth it. So this was originally <laughs> going to get filmed in, I believe, Vancouver up in Canada because there's more tax breaks. That would have been cheaper. Yeah. Yeah. And so they really, again, like tripling down on this Chicago thing. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, we're from the Midwest. So Mm. we've both been to Chicago, you know, hundreds of times. We know the city pretty well. This did not seem like a Chicago no. movie to me. <laughs> no. Like Palouse no Brothers, identifying. yeah, Chicago movie, pretty easy. Like yeah. it has that Chicago vibe. This has the Dark Knight is more of a Chicago movie than this. Hundred <laughs> percent. I wonder. And I wonder why that is, though, because they shot it all there, you know, on location. They they just didn't capture the spirit of Chicago in the city, which is a very specific thing. Like New York has its vibe, L.A. has its vibe, Chicago certainly has a vibe. And I think that like they I don't know, they sort of forced themselves into a corner with these early creative decisions uh, where they weren't really capturing uh, the vibrancy of the city or the character of the city. He talks about Chicago as a character, but he totally misses what that character is all about. Uh, And I find that sort of really fascinating. And then I, I think it's important to note that there's a lot of voiceover in this movie. 
and none of the voiceover has to do with the weather or Chicago. And so, like, it, if you're going to use that crutch anyways, and it's not always a crutch, but it definitely is here to get into the head of this character. And yet it, it, it it's an afterthought or a forethought, not even not, it's like they're, they were hoping that the subtext would speak for itself, but it just ended up being grayness. And then the, one of the more frustrating things about this concept of city as character, which is also already like, a you know, an overdone kind of cliche at this point, um, is that when the movie transplants to New York, when he goes to interview for the job, nothing changes nothing in terms changes. of absolutely yeah it, color palette or cinematography or anything it feels exactly the same so it just like they yeah. don't get new york they, it, it's in a way almost they shot chicago like new york as exactly. like a right. big city and like but chicago doesn't feel that way it has a super different vibe than new york uh yeah. and it's kind of just bizarre that they would spend 22 million dollars shoot the movie there and just kind of miss what was right in front of their eyes. But I think that's kind of the theme of this movie and what they were trying to do. Like it's, it's a, it's a pretty bold attempt without sort of getting the facts on the ground about what you're trying to do. And they already sort of blew past what would have been the sort of meteor parts of the story. They just totally threw those out in the beginning. And said, let's make a really cool, interesting arty film. Um, and stuff like another thing that sort of leads into that, there's a great article here from back when the film came out in the Chicago Sun Times about a local weather person <laughs> yes. uh, who was shadowed by Nicolas Cage uh, so he could learn about becoming a weatherman. Again, that makes sense on a big movie. You're committed to your art. You really want to understand it. But it's almost missing the entire point of why you're making this movie. Um, mm -hmm. And there's some interesting quotes for the weatherman. Uh, in this article, uh, he said it was an um, uh, an amusing portrayal. A lot of these movies portray stereotypes of weather people. The weather person is a kind of lightweight, not real deep. I don't think any movie has really addressed what a serious weather forecaster does. But quite frankly, I don't think that would be that interesting to people. And then right there, he's just like, what? It's sort of yeah. like I, he's basically saying I have this pretty boring job that doesn't matter all that much. But the movie's portraying it in a completely different way um, right and and also that he's at like this idea of the weather person and it, you know what what i kept thinking about um while watching this movie probably also because i just watched palm springs on hulu yeah um was uh, uh groundhog day um in which the main character once again does is that he's a weatherman and that's obviously thrown away for the purpose of the plot of the film pretty quickly but it 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 at least in that film, like Harold Ramis knew to keep that stereotype to the first act. But here it's stretched out so that it ends up just really feeling crude and almost like cruel to <laughs> to the profession. And I, w I also want to take issue with Skilling's quote about uh, there hasn't been a movie that really addressed what a serious weather forecaster does. Because uh, do we forget the movie Twister, which made uh, millions of dollars? Yes, that, <laughs> <laughs> a real classic, an in-depth character study of uh, yeah. storm chasers. Um, <laughs> and I love this last quote that uh, Skilling said, the weatherman that uh, Nick Cage mm -hmm. shadowed. It's a movie I'm surprised Hollywood made. We can all identify with the character, whether he's a weatherman or not. There's a real complexity to the David Spritz character. It was deeper than I expected. I mean, just sort of this like you can see all the red flags sort of going up, even just reading these right. like paratext around the movie that like this. This was a terrible idea. Like the entire yes. thing was just bad from the start. It was a dumb concept that didn't have a lot of depth to it. There was basically no emotional complexity to what they were talking about. And it was um sort of masturbatory writing i imagine about their like you said like their own fathers and what they were going through and that works sometimes but you have to relate it to a broader audience and it's sort of like um it just doesn't really it doesn't capture something big bold or universal at all it's very right. idiosyncratic and solipsistic so i think that's one of the major reasons why it doesn't work um Let's dive into release and receptions. This thing uh, was supposed to come out in late 2004, uh, but it got pushed back to April 2005 to avoid conflict uh, with Nick Cage uh, uh, doing the press tour for National Treasure, which obviously was a massive, huge movie. And then they pushed it back again in 2005 Oof. to October to do awards. And so it actually opened up at the Chicago Film Festival about a week before it opened up in theaters. I guess they thought that like this thing could get an Oscar nom. I mean, they, mm. they they had to be brainless if they really thought that. It must have been I mean, someone in PR is like, oh, maybe like maybe we'll get Michael Caine will get something or like a writing award. 
I mean, direction yeah. and film were out of the picture, and Nick Cage wasn't going to get a nomination, right? Yeah, I, it's, it seems, I mean, maybe Golden Globe, because you never know there, but yeah, it seems true. like you <laughs> you were banking on something that just wasn't going to happen. And, you know, the, the cynic in me wants to think that maybe they were trying to just bury it in award season because they knew it wasn't going to do much of anything um and save and save themselves from that but also like uh you note here um in our notes for today's episode that uh two week, two months um uh this is two months after lord of war opened which is another nick cage starring movie and that that totally flopped so like maybe i mean i think this combined with lord of war like you've got the two sides of nick cage um the the action star and the you know uh, i don't know budding comedic dramatic actor yeah. <laughs> i don't know he 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 was really trying and honestly like going back all the way to to his debut in moonstruck like it seemed like this would be i get why nick cage wanted to do this especially you know mapping out from his early days with coen brothers and moonstruck all the way to adaptation like it seemed like perfect for him so that i will say i, I can't imagine anybody else pulling this lead role off but you have to really like think about what you're trying to say in terms of uh, it being a wide release. I have a question for you about yeah. this idea of like if they wanted this to be a awards movie and they had not worried too much about making it glossy and like even gave it less money. And it did shoot in Vancouver and it was put out uh, on the independent circuit. Um, is Could you see a way in which this would have fared better maybe if it even had a different director or a different editor that really knew how to craft something into at least a passable indie drama yeah absolutely i really do i think if you cut the budget in half obviously shoot it up you know in vancouver and canada um don't i think one of the issues with this film more than anything and a lot of the critics bring this up is that it's a swing towards the fences uh right. but it's this is it, it's not the difference is that they swung for the fences in Major League Baseball. What they when they should have done is swung yes. for the fences in like Minor League Baseball. And so that would have worked, I think, a lot better. I mean, I would have a whole plan for this thing. You know, you got the, the platform release. You know, you hit certain markets and certain media markets and advertising for that sort of zany Little Miss Sunshine audience. Right. Mm-hmm. And you could have hit that. And if you you made it even weirder. Like that's the thing you got to turn turn up all the weirdness, turn up all the yeah. the characterizations just a bit, um, because you were never going to have a really, um, I would say, well done drama here. It was never going to happen, right? Uh, because the concept and the script is probably it, it seems like it's total kind of just not good. Um, interesting, yes, but like not uh, literary in any really sense. That's going to lead to like a great drama, and so that was never going to happen. So, but what you have on the page and stuff, you could have really amped it up amped it up on one hand and then play it smaller and then i think it could have worked overall but the way that they did this it's the typical it's like the no man's land it's an art film that's not for art people that's wide mm-hmm. release and of course financially it fails you know it opens to 4.2 million dollars on october 2005 and closes out you know adjusted for inflation now only to 17 million dollars which is a complete disaster worldwide it does what um, like $19 million unadjusted. So it doesn't even make back its production budget technically uh, on its worldwide box office. And again, studios don't get, they get at most half of that of that money. So it mm-hmm. only made $10 million total in revenue for the Oof. studio. Uh, now you got, now this is back in 2005. Remember, Blockbuster was huge and you could do a lot of the rental. But this, the thing is, everything goes off of box office. If there's no interest at the box office, it's usually not going to do that well in rentals. And so yeah. this thing was a financial disaster across the board. Uh, and like, you know, if you look at, you know, the reaction from the people who did see it uh, and the critics, you know, what are they saying about it? It's, it's a pretty across the board, like, uh, well, it, yeah, let's start with the positives because there's only a couple of them. Um, one interesting quote that you found um, is by Zadie Smith, the uh, best-selling novelist who I guess started out as a uh, film critic for The Telegraph <laughs> in the UK, yeah. which is crazy to me. That was a fun revelation. But she wrote, it's a deeply honest and comic performance and seems filled with all genuine humiliations that one imagines Cage himself has suffered in the past 10 years. I thought that was a little, you know, it's good that, you know, that's kind of why adaptation worked as well. Right? Exactly. It's Cage kind of 
poking yeah, fun at himself. Metafiction. Yeah, yeah. Right. But they, like you said, they didn't lean into it enough. Uh, Bill Mueller of Arizona Republic said the weatherman has a chance to be this year's sideways. That's exactly what we were talking about earlier. If that is, it's marketed right. And of course, as you just mentioned, that's where it failed miserably. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ebert had a, a in- in- interesting positive review of it because he was focusing a lot on this idea of observation. He says this film has moments of uncommon observation and touching insight, which I do think is true. There are elements of the script, both of uh, the in-person uh, dialogue as well as the voiceover where it seems like like I, I wished that we could have gone more in that direction there's there's a scene where he's walking down the street and his his uh, it's a flashback to why you know what began what was one of the central struggles between him and his wife of him not listening to her right yeah. and he's walking down the street trying to remember this thing and he says some horrible things and that's where like the moment where you realize like oh yeah we this is not a good person I should not actually be rooting for this guy but that was like the only really glimpse of that we saw. The rest of the movie was trying to get us to like really root for him. And that's where I think it struggled. They should have gone into that, you know, straight up bad guy, not even anti hero, but just like Yeah, like a jerk. You should just be yeah, a jerk. Exactly. And then he could find some well, redemption, you know. Right, right. Uh but that, that that was a whole other issue of the movie for me is the third act is just completely oh, just full bonkers. of art Yeah, it's uh <laughs> um the negative reviews kind of tap into that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Lisa Schwartzbaum, uh, who I've been following since I was a wee lad getting Entertainment Weekly at she's home. She's so good. Um, she's so good. She says, The Weatherman is what indie misery looks like when recreated by one of Hollywood's big studios. And I think that really ties into um, what my wife and I were saying about this. I think it's interesting looking at it from uh, a female perspective because it's a very male movie, right? Like you were looking... Uh, you mentioned the idea of like emasculation, which is just like drip. This movie's dripping with all yeah, the way through, absolutely. and and especially like looking like not ha- not giving much of any credence to any of the female characters, including the daughter and the wife, who are just like completely misrendered as actual people, much less characters in a Hollywood comedy drama thing. Right? Yeah. It's like. That, you know, um, say what you will about American Beauty. It's, it, you know, it's hard to talk about this many years later in the post uh, Me Too world. Uh, but at least those the female characters in there, you actually felt fle- they were felt fleshed out and real and they weren't um, they weren't as much uh, indebted to the idea of misery as so much of the weatherman absolutely is. And uh, one more from um, I like this one from Stephanie Zacherik from Salon.com. Um, she's now the lead critic at over at Time. She said, Dave's self-involvement is so extreme that he can't see that the bluntly human weaknesses of the people around him aren't his fault. We both pity him and want to shake him. Eventually, though, we just become bored by him. <laughs> and yes, it's it's it th- that lines it up like the first act is pity. The second act is wish that the movie would be over. And third hour, third act, we're just bored and just completely uh, I, I, it's ridiculous i could hardly get through the third act i was just like this is like pulling teeth and like one of the first mm-hmm. reviews that pops off you know the the industry um magazines variety and hollywood reporter always see these movies first and they always get one of the first two <coughs> uh, reviews to put out uh, and variety and they can kill the film especially yeah. in art film oh, yeah. and variety i love varieties uh, review here, which I'm sure is probably one of the first ones to get put out. One of the biggest downers to emerge from a major studio <laughs> in recent memory, right? It's just, and that's kind of the overall story of this film. You know, it's an attempt to make a very sideways, like nuanced adult drama that's going to connect with people in a very deep emotional way. And I think it fails on all of those levels. Which is why it's such a fascinating film to cover because you're sort of like, where did it all go wrong? And I think Mm -hmm. you're looking back on this, you know, in my sort of read, tracing back through this film, like where it went wrong. To me, this script, I haven't read the script, so I don't know, but just reading through the conception of how he made it, it's pretty light. But there's a lot of cases where a script is not super fantastic and you bring in people and they embellish certain parts. Oh, right. And they look at it. Right. Punch it up. Exactly. So I don't really see that as sort of like the the fatal flaw here. I think it's when you got gore involved. Like yep. if you got somebody who is a smaller filmmaker, more um, on the amateur indie side of things, they really could have done something special with this and took the source material and accented it in the right ways at the right moments to make something emotionally nuanced 
and that would really connect with people and make people feel something different when they went to go see it. And I think when you go when you watch this movie, you know, at home on Hulu now, you're going to watch it and be bummed out the entire time. (laughs) And you're just going to be like, wait, why did I just spend an hour and a half watching this film? Um, I don't think I got anything out of it. And I think it might have made my life worse. And so, like, that's one of those sort of things where it's it's just an incredibly failed attempt uh, on a whole variety of ways. And, you know, I just don't it's it's going to be it was a lost film and it will remain a lost film probably forever. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I think rightly so. Uh, It's definitely not worth the trouble. Uh, (laughs) It's I I do want to end on the note of like remembering the movies that did this well in 2005 yeah totally. this you know this on the smaller level trying to balance uh the the idea of human misery with uh you know comedic absurd absurdity like 2005 was actually a really good year you had ryan johnson's brick the noir comedy fantastic you had yeah. yep you had june bug uh one of my favorite movies <laughs> I know it's fantastic. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, Amy Adams and Brian McKenzie, uh, Ben McKenzie, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, you also had uh, me and you and everyone we know from Miranda July. Yeah. Like you, there, there, there's a way to do this, and it just didn't fit with the time. Like you, you don't, you don't have Spike Jones, so you don't have someone that can make it glossy and super me- and super meta and uh, intellectual. So like. Gore Verbinski, stay in your lane, and I think he's learned that by now, uh, right? He, he he is uh, he's he's he knows uh, what he is. Yeah, I think he knows what it is. I think you really do need to see a cure for wellness. Is what you need to do. Oh yes, that's right. That is your prescription for the week. Uh, oh my god! Because if you want to see Gore, like Gore is definitely a talented. He's a talented filmmaker. Like I love The Ring. I think The Ring was a wonderful rendering of that Americanized rendering of that story that works really well. I remember seeing the theater with a group of people. We were terrified. I was like, this is so good. And that muted blue palette thing works there perfectly. Um, hmm. But okay. like okay. wrong source material. Uh, and he, I don't know, like if you watch A Cure for Wellness, you're going to see gore un, uncaged, so to speak. And you're going to be like, either you're going to love it and think this is amazing, or you're going to be like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life, or both, which, yeah. is, which is what I felt when I saw it. Okay, okay. Um, I do want to, I should mention also that uh, uh, Verbinski is is hard at work on three different movies right now. Oh, God. Um, the, the remake of Clue, which is just it's going to be terrible yeah that's an um, abomination that he's doing but that. the other two are more interesting one sounds promising and the other one sounds horrible uh he is working on an adaptation of william monahan's novel lighthouse a trifle which is about an artist running away from the mafia who hides in a lighthouse uh in which kooky characters live so <laughs> i don't know <laughs> what's going on there i love it and then last but not least he's also planned to direct uh, butterfly a psychological thriller starring steve carell as a man trying to drive his wife insane oh, so we're still not done with the lady <laughs> issues are we i love it um so that's all we have for the weatherman this week what do we have next week chris We are going to head back to New Movie Town and uh, look at the newly released on VOD First Cow from Kelly Reichert, one of, uh, I would say, the best filmmakers working today. Awesome. That'll be fun. Uh, Thanks for listening. This has been Film Trace. Film Trace.